Okay, so I had kind of avoided talking about this MLM in particular because I felt that I was very out of the loop on it. And I'm like, oh, well, everyone else is already covering this one. Everyone knows more than me on it. And then I thought, maybe, you know, some of the viewer base, that's you guys, will also be out of the loop on it. And maybe we can sort of get somewhat into the loop on it um, together. I thought that'd be kind of fun. So uh, Tish of the channel Echo Echo, link in the description, sent over this um, training for Elomir. And so I haven't seen it yet. Hopefully it's good. Um, and I thought that, you know, we could learn what the opportunity we've been out of the loop on is all about. And we can make all the monies and be all the healthies. OK, so let's go. Ooh, my mic is clipping. That's not good. He's written several books. If you guys have not read any of his books, uh, he's got one on social media marketing. He's got well, one on how to be a freakishly effective leader, which I absolutely love and definitely apply those tactics and strategies in my business and in my team. So if you haven't picked up any of Ray's books, I highly recommend that. Um, but Ray was nice enough to come on here tonight um, to share some wisdom with you guys in terms of we've just, you know, got our Elmir uh, business off the ground here. We're about 60 days in. Those of you that have been, you know, in it before launch on July 5th, you guys have been working even longer, but we have launched really strong out of the gate and now it is time to move into sustainable growth it's like we were all excited we're all hyped up from everybody coming in and you know we've even seen a couple of people that have left already because they they just couldn't stick it out from a startup standpoint and that's okay and you know van's pretty transparent about that too she's she only wants people that want to be with us not because we're enticing them to be with us and that is something that i love wait what not because what do you mean you're not enticing them? What well, that made no sense to me. What is I don't even get what he's trying to say there with that. Also, notice how they were talking about people who were in there before launch and then there was a launch. So, yeah, my hypothesis that I've that I've been coming to about basically MLMs as a whole is that I believe that the ground floor is never open to the public in the first place. I believe that they handpick the ground floor from their friends and their families and their just general cronies. And then they launch and, and maybe the second floor or the third floor will do okay with money wise. But the big, big money on the ground floor, that was never publicly available that like they that was already filled by the time it launched that's my hypothesis and that kind of lends some credence to it because he's talking about the people who were in before the launch of actually seeing because as we stick it out as we grow our elamir businesses moving forward here we're going to be rewarded for that and there's no better person to help us understand how to grow our businesses than ray ray welcome thank you very much for being here Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to uh, be on here. I see some familiar faces. What's up, Ron and Amanda and Angie and see uh, several, several familiar faces. It's good to be uh, good to be on here, man. Appreciate awesome. it. Yeah, you've been you've been around the block a few times in terms of being in the industry. You've seen a lot over the years, haven't you? In terms of just how the industry has grown, how's it expanded, how it's, you know, uh See, they're always, they always have a new grift in the MLM space. They, they never get out of it, probably because they don't have any skills that would be transferable to a different career. All they know how to do is how to create a pyramid scheme. And so that's all they can do. It's just one to another. It's always the next grift and the next grift and the next grift. That's always how it is with these, with these people who are in it for life or whatever. The people who are... Um, ground floor, who are founders, who are starting them. It's always the same shit. It's always the, a different flavor of the same scam. Uh, morphed with the digital age of social media and everything. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> you know, when I 
when I first, I would say, got serious about network marketing, because I had I had been in network marketing and had struggled and, you know, bumbled and failed. And but when I got serious about network marketing, you know, everyone was everyone was telling me that social media wouldn't duplicate. I remember I was at uh, the, you know, one of the early. So first of all, you guys are a new company. Uh, I I became the number one income earner of a company I joined in pre-launch. And so I. Right there. Number one income earner of a company that he joined in pre-launch. See what I mean? What is this pre-launch? Pre-launch sounds like it's only open to a limited selection of people. I doubt it's open to everybody. They might try to make it sound like it is, but I'm pretty sure it's not. Like what is pre-launch? So slimy. And besides, oh, you you weren't serious about network marketing the first time you tried it? Is that why? That's why it didn't work for you? Oh, okay, sure. I know I understand all that it's like, you know, when the company's new. And let me tell you, everyone wants to be in uh, at the top. Everyone wants to be in when a company's new until they're in new. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and then true. they're like, dang, uh, well, how come uh, the shipment isn't going out? Or how come the software is messed up? And and obviously. Okay, well, I feel like that's more of a, uh, you know, you you only you once you have something, you're a little bit less appreciative of it, of it, maybe. Plus, you've. If you're in, if you're in at the actual ground floor of this MLM, this probably isn't your first rodeo, so you're probably a little bit, you know, taking it for granted. Besides, <laughs> I they always say that it doesn't matter when you get in, right? They always say, "Oh, it doesn't matter. You can get in now. It do, you don't have to have gotten in, you know, in the at the beginning." And yet, here's this guy who clearly is very experienced in MLM saying that it the the absolute best is to not even get in at the beginning but to get in before the beginning okay okay cool hmm. you know I I know uh you know you know some of the people behind it Terry and you know some of the different people behind it and you have some amazing amazing people um but uh, yeah, when you're a new, you know, you just got to understand that there's, there's going to be some bumps in the road and you either have vision or you don't. And, and so, um, you know, there's other options for, for people without, you know, vision, but you, you do have to have vision for you to, uh, stick through it. Cause there's going to be some bumps. There's going to be some surprises. Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, I remember I, I, I was just telling this story, but I, uh, I had a guy, a business owner up in, I think he lived in Port Charlotte, I think. And he was fired up. He was, he was, you know, ready to go. And, and, uh, he came on board and he's like, well, you know, man, I'm gonna crush this thing. And then the next day he was like, Hey, where's, where do I order the business cards? And I said, Oh, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have a lot of stuff right now, but you know, we'll get that stuff in. And he goes, well, how am I supposed to build without business cards? I'm out of here. Yep. Like, Really? I feel like that's less of a problem with the pre-launch thing and more of a problem with this person clearly um, is still living in 1999. I don't want your business card. And since when is your business card like an absolute requirement to to do anything? You know, you can just you could you could share your contact info in your phone or you could add them on some kind of social media. I I don't know. I I don't think I've ever used a business card that I've taken from a person who was giving it to me. Like I'm just like, eh, whatever. It's it's like Mitch Hedberg says about flyers. It's like they're saying, here, you throw this away like that. Like that's how easily you folded. Um, And I'm like, all right, okay. And went on to make millions of dollars with that company. And and we had a blast. It was was a great, great company. Um, I mean, sounds like it. I'm sure that the making millions of dollars off of the people you were exploiting helped. Decided, my wife and I decided in 2016 to no longer actively build a team and uh, focus on the industry. We like to make a difference at the industry level. And so that's what we've been doing for, you know, for quite a while now. 
um, had the pleasure, you know, we've worked with a lot of rock stars, um, you know, teams of 100,000, uh, 750,000. We've worked with some, you know, large leaders, some great companies, and, and we've had a lot of fun. Um, so I want to hopefully maybe dis- demystify some of, you know, how to build and, and give some suggestions and happy to take questions, you know, as well. Um, and so I don't want to assume that everyone knows my story. So I'll, I'll very quickly just, you know, just share that. Uh, what the hell were you telling us before? Also, I mean, let, let's keep track of how many minutes it's been until a product is mentioned. Um, so I had worked my way up in, a, in the corporate world to a pretty good paying salary, pretty high paying salary for someone that never finished high school on time, didn't finish college. And, um, but I wasn't happy. And, you know, and I looked at, oh, for the love of God, number one, how much was it? Cause that's relevant. Number two, 90% of the time when someone says that they left a job because they weren't happy, there's another reason there, there just is. Because if you already had another another job lined up, then you would just say that. You would say that you left to go do that. You wouldn't say that like you left and then, you know, this nebulous kind of thing where you're like, oh, I wasn't happy. You wouldn't say you wouldn't say that. You would just say like, I left to start this. I, I don't know. That's such bullshit. People do not leave. People don't just leave jobs that they uh, that they need and that um, are paying their bills without a reason. They usually have an actual reason, like they might not have been leaving voluntarily, but usually people will have something lined up first. And then if they don't, then that's a, that's just a red flag about their behavior, because that's pretty weird. My boss and his boss and her boss, and none of them were happy either. And they were making more money than me, certainly. Um, but they were having problems at home. They, it was very clear that like, that was just going to be my future if I stayed there. How do you know that the problems at home were the result of the job? Like, what does that have to do with where they're working? Because if it's problem, did they have problems at work or did they only have problems at home? Because that sounds like maybe it's a at home problem. And, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And so, uh, long story short, I. Okay, that was long story too short. You okay? So he didn't tell us what industry this job was in. He didn't tell us how much he made. He didn't even tell us the job title. Didn't tell us the job title of the people whose experience experiences he's recounting. Didn't tell us what the relation of those people was to him. I mean, he said boss, but it didn't say like what was that person's role what was their role in relation to you didn't tell us that didn't tell us how long he was at this job didn't tell us um what exactly he was doing didn't tell us uh how much his boss made versus him all of those would have been good details to know what year was this you know so just just wanted to to zero in there on how incredibly vague that story was. And I'm not saying it's something deceptive or whatever. Well, it is deceptive, I think. But I'm not saying I'm not saying he's trying to cover something up. I'm saying that this sounds like perhaps he's just sort of pulling it out of his ass or just sort of um making a real event simpler than it is or I, I don't know it just this is it's so vague people don't usually tell stories like that that sounded weird it sounded like you meant to tell a story but you didn't yeah i left the corporate world which and i started my own business and not in network marketing but in real estate and you know Hey, it didn't work out, <laughs> and uh, and I didn't want to go crawling back to a job. Uh, and someone, uh, my good friend Chris out of Cape Coral, Florida, invited me to a meeting. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to figure this thing out. And so there were a few things that I did 
um, every day and became the number one income earner in that company when it was pre-launch, um, when we had you know one product, when we weren't in anywhere but you know in the U.S. and most states. Okay, so that was the first mention of the word product. We don't know what the product is. We just know it existed. And we also know that the number one income earner got in at pre-launch through his friend. So that's a bit different from the opportunity that most people in the general public would have. Because for most people, it's going to be after launch and probably way after the launch because it still has to build exponentially. So just the probability that it's going to be many, many levels down the pyramid by the time you've heard about it is very, very high. You know, you start off, you got one person getting five people, getting five people, getting five people. Still, those first four rows, that's only like 625 people. But then it's going to keep growing. And so just the way that the probability works out, even if you're just totally random, randomly um, picking out a spot on that pyramid, it, you're going to be near the bottom. That's just the likelihood. Unless you know somebody personally who is on the uh, like executive board for it, that's where you're going to be. There were no one. Uh, I wasn't the master distributor. I wasn't anything special. I was at the bottom of the bottom. What are you talking about? You got in, you got in on pre-launch. Of a bottom of an inside leg, inside leg, inside leg. Um, and... Uh what a load of bullshit you got in at pre-launch don't tell us that you are just like everybody else uh, i even had you know i had you know leaders that that promised me some stuff that you know didn't didn't do it and and i built anyway and i decided i'm gonna make this thing happen i'm not gonna complain about what i don't have or what isn't ready or or what's lacking and i just uh i just went to work so what he's doing here is he's managing down the new distributors expectations. He's managing them down to not complain about resources that were promised and not provided. He's managing them down to not expect um, any type of help or any type of assistance such that they will just go off and keep giving us your money. They just want they they want you to just keep doing what you're doing and don't come crying to us basically. And you know there were three things that I did but I want to I want to break those down in a little bit different, you know, fashion so that you really understand it. The three things that I did to become the number one income earner of that company, which uh, I would argue today would still make you, you know, maybe not the number one earner, but it would make you a top earner in any company. I had read a book. See, we're just gradually chipping away. Called Go For No. And that book, it just kind of made sense to me. And that it sounds like a terrible title, doesn't it? Like go for no, like I get plenty of those. Um, how many yeses, man? And and so, but it made sense to me because it does two things. It reduces your resistance to rejection and it reduces your reaction to rejection. And too many people are struggling with one or both of those. They're either too worried about getting rejected, so they never ask. Or they get a no and then they're, they're eating ice cream, you know, the rest of the day. And, and so I read that book. I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. And so I set a no goal and I, I figured I'm like, you know, I have big goals because I was I had big debt. I was in massive, massive debt. And uh, I'm like, I got big goals. So I thought I thought you were making money at your corporate job. That was pretty good. So what's with the mismanagement? You know, what would make sense for me to really uh, build a large organization? So I set a goal of 20 no's a day and, and 20 no's a day is, is unreasonable. It's, you know, it's borderline crazy. I know three people that uh, have come to me and told me they did the 20 no plan. All three became million dollar earners. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Um, but, um, you know, the, the folks that wrote go. 
Sure, but that's really hard to come up with 20 people to ask every day. Do you say 20 knows a day? Yeah. So I can't even think of, I can think of 20 people for like day one. After that, I don't think I can think of 20 people. So yeah, of course they're gonna do pretty well, especially if they're in pre-launch like you. You said that you knew these people, so if they know you and they're in your peer group, they're probably also in the pre-launch. How many people didn't do the the 20 no plan that were in pre-launch and still also became million dollar earners or whatever the fuck? Yeah, you don't answer that, do you? For no, they like my story so much that we actually did a book together called Go For No for Network Marketing. And, and so the whole, you know, go for no. And let me tell you, maybe you're on here and you feel like you're super skilled, right? Like you're like, just amazing. You're a super closer. You're really, really good. And you're like, I don't even know how I could get 20 no's. Well, uh, you can by reaching higher. And so the go for no, it, it actually adjusts to your skill level because I, I started getting much better at closing. So I started reaching higher. I mean, I brought in. Uh, I brought in people that were running 10, $20 million businesses and, and they became reps of mine. You know, uh, someone that was in my, um, uh, that I brought into my team, who's now, he's going to be speaking at our event next month, Russell Brunson. So Russell Brunson's a co-founder of, of ClickFunnels and that company, I don't, I don't know exactly, but it's over $150 million a year company. And, you know, and he was in my team. So like, as, as I started to increase my skill, I, I started to, Jesus Christ, all the grifters on the internet know each other, apparently. It, the, really? The click, really? Go for bigger no's. I started asking bigger people and sometimes I'd get a yes. So, you know, pretty powerful. And go for no isn't go for non-responses because I got thousands of those. Um, it's actually someone telling you no. Hey, are you open to take a look at what I'm doing to make extra money? Hey, are you open to take a look at this product that I got that helps me with this? Um, no. Okay, that's one. And, and so that was the first thing. That was the first kind of part of my of my routine. And the second part was I hated prospecting. And notice I did it anyway, but I hated prospecting. I hated reaching out to people. And I wanted to create a way for people to reach out to me. I wanted to create, you know, some kind of, you know, we really didn't use the term attraction marketing back then. It really hadn't, it wasn't popular back then, um, that term at least. And so I started um, doing a video a day. And so I figured if I do a video a day, um, eventually someone somewhere has got to see these darn things and, and I'll start generating some leads. And so my goal was to get people reaching out to me. And so in the beginning, no one's seeing my videos. And oh, by the way, they're terrible. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I'm, I'm like outside. I'm like a weatherman. Ray Higdon here. And you can barely hear it. You're like, what, what do you say? And, uh, you know, the sun's directly behind my head. So you can't even see who is it again. Like, it's just terrible. But I was just moving forward. I'm just failing forward. Just keep doing it. And so I uh, just kept doing it, kept going, kept showing up. And at one point... I was uh, generating over 3,000 leads a month without ads. Now, prior to TikTok, that's pretty impressive, okay? Now, since TikTok, I mean, we have people on our team, or, you know, not my network marketing team, but people like, you know, that work for us or people in our membership and our rank makers that, that you know, generate that kind of stuff with TikTok and Instagram Reels and Facebook Reels. But back then... That was that was pretty good. That was a pretty good deal. And and so when you're generating that kind of you know leads, you know you can you can do pretty good with with recruiting, and it's not that difficult. Uh, but uh, but that didn't. Happen. Okay, number one. What about product sales? We still have not even mentioned the Elomir product, so I still don't know what it is. Number two. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't think that 3,000 people were actually contacting you about uh, joining your company or whatever. If I bet he's talking about like 3,000 maybe interactions or something. I don't, I don't buy it because their, their attraction mar marketing shit is never interesting. It's never actually attractive. Happened right away. That took, that took me some time. That took me a while of showing up and, and not getting results for, you know, for a while. I am so sick of this showing up language. And then the third thing, very simple, just self-development. You know, every day I had to do something to work on myself, whether it was, 
you know, reading a book, whether it was reading a chapter, listen to audios, et cetera. You always need the brainwashing, don't you? I'm telling you this self-help st- stuff, like it's so addictive that it, it, that it sort of, it just makes you even more vulnerable to the MLM's tactics. And again, did go on to become uh, the number one earner of that company. And so uh, Brooks asking, what were the videos about? And so I talked about, you know, if I had to do it over, it'd be a very different story, it'd be a very different story. But back then I talked about what I was learning. And so I used a process called ILT. And this is something that I've been teaching for, you know, 10 years. ILT stands for invest, learn, teach. And so all of you on here are I and Ellen, right? So you, you invested your time to be on here. Right. I don't know if they charge for it or not. Sometimes teams do, sometimes they don't. But you invested your time at least to be on here. You're hopefully learning and you're I'm gonna teach you a bunch more stuff, but you're learning stuff. Imagine paying for this. Imagine paying for training for your job. Stuff. The question is, will you teach? And so I don't read a book that videos don't come from, right? So I don't ever read a book. And then just like, all right, all done here. Like, no, I take some of the concepts that I learned from that book and I edify the book. I edify the author and I create videos and you You edify the author. I don't think you know what edify means. That's not what the word edify means. You know, that used to be, you know, just Facebook lives or, you know, YouTubes, you know, now it's what I'll do is if I'm going through a book, especially a good book, I'll take every major note and every major note becomes its own Instagram reel. And so it's the, it's the simplest way for you to come up with content is just take what you're, you're, so you're just plagiarizing, I guess. What you're learning now, a different way to look at this and, and, you know, a few years ago, I created some, some mantras that, that, that drive me is, uh, and mantra number one is help the person you used to be. So a lot of people, they struggle with what is my brand? What's my avatar? What's my target? What's my niche? Right. And, and so in the absence of something fancy, just help the person you used to be. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of shades of that with me. You know, I mean, I, I grew up in a very abusive home. I've been broke twice. Um, you know, I struggled with, with parenting. I got four kids. I struggled with parenting because I just, I didn't have a good role model and I struggled with self-worth of being present. And so I'd be with my kids for 4.2 minutes and have to be on my phone doing something. Uh, been a workaholic. I've been an, uh, I've been a successful, but unfulfilled person. And so Every single one of those types of people I can help. There's always the sob story. Am I right? So it's never just, you know, talking about an opportunity and, hey, do you want to do this? It's always like, oh, let me go find vulnerable people who uh, I know are vulnerable because they're kind of like me. Maybe they come from an abusive home, which that's a terrible thing to target, man. Uh, So you're trying to find vulnerable people because those are the people who are most likely to join an MLM because if things are going great, they're not going to join. Because that's who I used to be. And, and so, you know, maybe you're on here and, you know, you wanted to, you know, you've been wanting to lose some weight and, you know, you've lost 10 pounds so far, but you got more to go. Help a person wants to lose 10 pounds. Right. And so the big, the big divide is people that don't understand marketing, they think, well, I have this, I have this thing for sale. I must talk about this thing in all of my videos. And that is very limiting. And it's very, eh, it's like, okay, she's got her thing for sale. All right. Instead of the thing you have for sale, think about the who you're trying to talk to. And that's where help the person you used to. Right. So you're talking about Instead of talking about the thing that you're selling or trying to sell a product, you're trying to sell a dream to a vulnerable person. That's exactly what it is. That's how how MLM works. That's how it is. I mean, he's not wrong in the sense of no one's going to give a shit that you have a product for sale for the most part. Not if it's an MLM product, at least. Certainly not. 
But, you know, the answer to that is not recruiting. B is, is just so powerful because you know them. You overcame that. You survived that. Maybe you were in a bad relationship. Maybe you, you know, had trauma in your life. You know, maybe you um, were burnt out at work. You know, maybe you, um, you know, maybe you were struggling with parenting and you got better at it. Do you know how many people struggle with parenting? Like help that person. And so help the person. You help that person, AKA prey on them because you know how to prey on them because you know where the pain points are. It's a lot like that beach body call uh, with the, um, with the child with special needs where she she just went right back in and used that community that supported her to as 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 a business model used to be is it's just, it's such a powerful driver and such a a a clear uh vision because you're good at that see a lot of times people either they they go into sales mode and think i must sell this thing so i'm going to talk about Right. Uh, you know, this bioflavonoid, you know, that's like how many, how many videos you make about bioflavonoids or whatever. Right. It's like kind of gets old, kind of gets boring. Uh, right. And you talking about your opportunity never gets old or boring. OK. Um, or they try to be a master of something they don't really know. So they think, ooh, you know what? I'm going to talk about network marketing, but they've they've never really made it in network marketing or, or they. they yeah, that's why you're at the bottom trying to recruit people. They want to talk about social media marketing, but you know they they haven't built a big following. Yeah, that's like everybody in network marketing. If they had a big social media following already, they wouldn't need this training. Instead of that, talk talk to the person you used to be. Like, what advice would you give yourself from two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? And you know, I remember, you know, I. Um, um, well, I never did join an MLM, but I would, I would, I would give myself that advice would be if, if someone comes up to you and tells you that they have an opportunity, don't join. Okay. Just, you know, you got bigger fish to fry besides five years ago. Oof. After, after high school, I got into a relationship and, uh, she like totally ripped my heart out. Now I was, you know, I had it coming the signs were all there, right? But I went from totally getting my rip, my heart ripped out to being depressed and all kinds of stuff to you know getting into a relationship only because I felt safe in that relationship, not that it was the ideal relationship. How many people could I help with that, right? And help them see, hey, you know, you deserve like a great relationship. You can have a great relationship, and so. Uh, how about not have a relationship for a while? There are things that you know that other people haven't learned yet. And you going on video. So one of my clients, she is a multiple six-figure earner in her company. Uh, she has five kids and all of them are doing really well. They're all in sports. And it's like amazing. Like she's got a great business. She's got great kids. They're getting scholarships and stuff like and she wanted to talk about network marketing, which she does know, and she is good at, but I'm like, God, I think there's a lot more people that are interested in how the hell you did both, right? How, how, were, you, how were you a mom? Because it's rare to meet the successful mom that doesn't have mom guilt, right? That stops a lot of moms. And, and so like, she just, she started talking, okay, started talking more about being and how exactly is it going to assuage that to phrase it in how did you, how were you able to do both? Did anyone ask you, sir, how you were able to be a father and a successful business owner, business owner in quotes? So is it only male dreams that are valid? Whereas when women accomplish something, you have to ask them how did you manage to do both? Like what's, how does that work? Mom and, and what she does to help, you know, her kids with, you know, with their making their sports, you know, meetings and activities and all this different stuff. And what's their father doing? What are you doing?
Like it just blew up. Like people are way more interested in that. And then when you're not talking about that thing that you sell and you're talking about something else, people start to trust you more. Then they start to connect with you more. And then you can abuse that trust. Then you build a bigger following. Then you get in the DMs and you say, you know, hey. Want to fuck? Uh, I don't know if you're even aware that I do this side business, but I have a side business and that's what helps you make all these meetings. And all of a sudden you're in the direct message with someone that trusts you and, and, and uh, you know. And you can just take advantage of it right there. You can just exploit it, abuse the trust and just, you know, just dollar signs in your eyes. And guess what? They're going to, most of them, most of them are going to see right through you. Uh, wants to be more like you. And that's a really easy conversation to have. They don't want to be more like you. They want to be more like the image of you that you present on social media. And those are two very different things. And so, and, and Michael, I don't know if you planned on this being an interview or are you okay with me? Keep going or did yeah, you, you wanna... just keep going. Keep giving the okay, all right, okay. value there. Yep. Um, and so, so I would do it very differently. So I, I talked about the things I was learning, which is mainly business, social media, marketing, and that kind of stuff. Um, because back then I just wasn't, I wasn't willing to be vulnerable. I didn't even know what that meant. It just sounded weird. I think you still don't know what it means. And I'm starting to think that nobody knows what it means. Right? Like, mm, no thanks. Right? You're at a buffet and they're like, would you like some vulnerable? No, thank you. Right? Like I just wasn't vulnerable. So basically what we're talking about here is emotional manipulation, taking advantage of uh, serious things that have happened in people's lives or serious pain points that they have. And you're either making up some of your own or you are using your own experiences to target other people who have had similar ex experiences as you in order to emotionally manipulate them into being personally profitable to you. I, I wanted to be Superman. I wanted to be perfect and awesome and unstoppable and, and, you know, whatever. If you think Superman is perfect, you know nothing about Superman. And what I learned is literally everything in my career changed when I started being vulnerable and I didn't even. Yeah. Emotional manipulation is very powerful. I, I don't know why you're surprised. That's why um, we. That's why we generally are not tolerant of people who are emotionally manipulative because you can get a lot of what you want that way. And it's pretty slimy. I didn't even plan it. OK, I had a, a, a leader in my team that I had confided in and and I told him, I'm like, yeah, man, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting out of foreclosure. Right. And, and in the real estate crash, I got wiped out. I went through a divorce. I went through foreclosure. I was, you know, at one point literally living on my, my buddy's couch. Um, and it see here, here's the sob story. You know what I never share at work? I would never tell them something like this, just unprompted. It, it just wasn't, it wasn't pretty. And I confided, you know, I told, you know, you know, this leader that I'm like, yeah, man, you know, I mean, I'm bouncing back from foreclosure. And he went to go, this company, uh, he got some kind of deal with a different company and, and he was going to, to leave. And he's like, hey, I'm going to tell everyone you're in foreclosure. And I'm like, oh, hmm. Hmm. Eh, I will. <laughs> and so I go live that day. To guilt trip people into spending more money. That's disgusting. Shame on you. And uh or actually, I don't, I don't know if life was even around back then, but uh, I did a video that day and I said, hey, I got something to admit to y'all. And and that is, uh, man, when the real estate market crashed, I got wiped out. I got wiped out and I, I you know, I went into foreclosure and. Um, you know. Which made people feel bad for you and probably made them more likely to stick with you or try to help. How do you not see how slimy this is? You know, this network marketing has been bouncing me back. Everything skyrocketed. Yeah. See what happens when you are emotionally manipulative. This is manipulative. This is this is guilt tripping people into giving you money and joining your organization and staying in it because they don't want to be the reason that the guy in foreclosure, you know, can't get back up on his feet. 
You're taking advantage of people's sympathy for you. That's what you're doing. That's exactly what you're doing here. And you don't even care. You don't even see it as being that, but that's what it is. Shame on you. When I started letting down my guard and I stopped trying to be perfect and I stopped trying to, you know, not let any weakness show, everything took off. Everything was crazy. I started getting asked to be on stages. I started being asked to be on podcasts. I started. And so, you know, vulnerability is such a major key. And, um, that's what, okay. First of all, there's no key of vulnerability is not a major key. It's not a minor key either. Okay. It's neither key. There's no key of vulnerability. Second of all, yeah, that's the whole, that's the crux of the whole pitch with an MLM. There's always a sob story. So of course, whoever's got the best sob story, which it sounds like yours was a really good one that got people to feel bad for you and to feel sympathetic toward you and out of the goodness of their hearts, try to help you out. Of course, you're going to be on the stage and stuff because they need those sob stories so that other people who relate to those sob stories will get suckered in by your MLM as well. You know, we don't have time to get into all the, all this different stuff, but I'm telling you that thing that you're scared to admit, so many people, other people have struggled with that and having the courage, which is what it is, having the courage to be vulnerable is, is game changing because most people assume everyone else is full of crap. And, and so when you are trying, I'm the expert, I'm perfect. They, they just don't believe you anyway. So they're not going to connect with you. They're not going to buy your stuff. They're not going to get in your direct messages or anything. But when you're willing to be vulnerable, that's when you're really helping people. That's when you're really manipulating people. That's when you are being emotionally manipulative. The reason that people... I would highly suggest if there's something that you've been struggling to admit that perhaps you share that with a close friend, a best friend, a family member that you're close with, that you can trust with that. Whoever it is that is already in your life that you trust and that you have a great relationship with and who you know, you don't have to be afraid to admit whatever that is to Maybe with them, maybe not with some random people on the internet. Oh, wait, except the reason that you would is is so that you can take advantage of the relatability and the trust that that would build up so that you can deceive them into thinking that you are trustworthy when really all you're doing is seeing dollar signs everywhere. That's all you're doing. It's disgusting. It is utterly shameless and you should be ashamed of yourself. You're really transforming people and you're just showing up differently. And so, you know, now I'm, I'm willing to show, you know, all my, you know, scars and all the different things that I've, you know, the barbed wire that I've, I've climbed through and, uh, and help people out. So there should be no mystery as to what builds a network marketing business. Uh, I've boiled it down to four uh, key components and, and these they all happen to start with the letter P. <laughs> and, and so uh, you may want to write these down. Is the first one pyramid? And uh, uh, they're, I'm, I'm purposely not putting them in order of uh, importance uh, for a reason, um, but we'll discuss them. And so it's pipeline, posture, position, and perspective, okay? So pipeline, posture, position, perspective. So pipeline, what's pipeline? Pipeline is a very simple concept, but it's a concept that eludes most network marketers. And they're literally confused on why they don't have more success. And pipeline is the answer for anything performance-based. Period. Anything performance based has to do with pipeline. Anything performance career based has to do with pipeline. Pipeline is how many people are you talking to, following up with, setting appointments with, uh, possibly depending on the company, doing demonstrations for, sending samples to, whatever. Now it's it's the same 
in anything performance-based careers, a realtor, pipeline, car sales, pipeline, right? literally, literally anything that's performance-based, pipeline. And so, you know, my wife, she's a, um, she's now, as of this year, uh, she's a, a luxury realtor here in Naples, Florida, and that's her passion. She loves real estate. Um, she's flipped a lot of property. She's done a lot of investments and, you know, she knows her stuff. And, and so, um, you know, but even with a, a license, right, you know, she had to go through all this training and it sounded horrible and uh, she What's with the air quotes on license? She got her license, but even with that license, if she doesn't tell anyone she's a realtor, she doesn't make any money and no one's confused by that fact. No one's confused. Now in network marketing, you have all these anti MLMers, right? They're, they're, you know, quite the crew and hi. And, um, and you know, these are people that joined a network marketing company, didn't do the work, and now complain about the network marketing problem. Uh, I've never joined a network marketing company. Not that that makes me better, but just so that you know that I'm not coming at this from being personally burned. I'm not personally burned by it. I just think you're a piece of shit and your whole industry is pieces of shit. And I've seen people get taken advantage of by it. And it pisses me off when people are dishonest and are profiting off their own dishonesty. So, sorry. Promises that they believed or they, you know, they were told or, or whatever. And it, it just shouldn't be a mystery. And so when people come to me and say, Ray, you don't understand, man, I'm in a tough place. And, you know, I want to be a top earner. I'm right where you were, man. I want to make it happen. I know with one question, if they're on the path, how many people last week did you ask were open to your product or business? One question. That's all I need. The simple fact of the matter is, is there's several, there's several factors in play here with this. Number one, some people just, just, know more people and talk to more people than others. Some people are just like that. Some people always want to talk to new people and and just they gradually build up this this sort of Rolodex, for lack of a better term, just through the way that they live their life. The way that they live their lives. And some people are it it's it's really i think in my opinion it is a very innate thing some people are like that and some people just aren't like that i'm not like that <laughs> um I, I i just i'm just not i don't have that drive to constantly um to constantly be meeting new people and and putting more and like filing away more people's info in my head like i that's it's just not the way that i operate and so for someone who is more like me that's going to be incredibly challenging if it's even possible at all to have the level of people that i'm talking to reach his level second of all it's very different when you're getting in in the later stages of the MLM than when you are at the beginning. Because when you, number one, it could be pre-launch. Number two, if you are at the end rather than toward the beginning, a lot more people are going to have heard of this thing already. And if they weren't interested the first time, they're not going to be interested the second time. And a lot of these people are going to be sort of the same people because the same kind of type of people who are in like the same type of place in their life is is going to be getting reached out to by multiple people because the way that you found this person to talk to is probably similar to how the distributor next to you found this person. So you're probably finding some of the same people and it's just becoming more and more likely that you have exhausted your supply of potential recruits. I mean, you know, I find like I had some super recruiters on my team. I had some people that were really good. I was, I'm, I'm, I was good at recruiting for sure. And I had some really good recruiters and the best recruiters I've ever met close about 30%. And so 
That's insane. 30%. I don't believe it. So if they talk to 10 people, they'll probably get three people on, right? Unless they're using some, you know, like a funnel or something like that, that, that is more qualifying on the front end. But if you still, if they speak to 10 people, maybe they get three, maybe four. What a load of bullshit. There's no way. And, and so uh, that's if you're a super recruiter. If you're not a super recruiter, you're getting five to 10% probably. And so. No, you're not. There's no way. The average person as a, doing recruiting for network marketing is not getting five to 10%. That's just, they're just not. Five to 10%. That's incredible. The average person is not going to be able to get five to 10%. They, they just aren't. And notice how we're not even talking about selling a product. We're talking about recruiting, aren't we? Yeah, it's always about recruiting. So if you work those numbers, you know, backward, I'm talking about recruiting. Now, product a little different. You can have, a, you know, you can have a product. And if you lead with the product, you can, you can close more, more than that. But. No, you can't. This person doesn't know anything about actual marketing. You're never going to have close. You're not, you're never going to have conversion rates that high. At the end of the day, it's. How many people are you talking to following up with set appointments with, et cetera? If you close 100% of the business you reached out to, uh, how would that look? That would never happen. For some, it'd still be zero because <laughs> they're not reaching out to anybody. And so if you're not reaching out to anybody, you're making what you should be making. And you know, I here's the thing. And, this, and I'm not talking about just network marketing here anymore. I'm talking about generally, if you're not the type of person who can do this selling to people or where a core function of your job is doing this persuasive stuff with people or having to talk to a bunch of people and it's just in 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 it is not something that is natural to you don't try to never ever try to force yourself to become extroverted or whatever it, it will never happen. You will never change yourself into that. I, I promise you, you won't. It will always be so miserable. It will always be like pulling teeth. You will be so much happier when you accept yourself the way that you are. And you accept that that's not me. And something that requires me to be that is not the thing for me. That's that's just not the thing that I need to be doing. That's not something I'm good at. And that's fine. All right. There's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of, uh, you know, extroverts. Like I always say, extroverts and morning people. Always, they're always assuming that everyone who isn't like them is just fundamentally broken and inferior. And you get a lot of rhetoric around it too, where they are like, oh, if you're, here's how to be an extrovert, here's how to be a morning person. Okay, well, you know what? Those things aren't me, and I'm not going to try to force myself to become those things. I'm not anymore. Nope. Nope. I'm great the way I am. Well, that may sting, but this isn't this isn't mystical. It's not, you know, your affirmations are what dictates, you know, how much money you make. No, they can help, right? And we'll talk about But can they though? About that. But at the end of the day, Unless you're so powerful, which I'm, I'm not there yet, unless you're so powerful that you can manifest without opening your mouth, then you're going to have to open your mouth and you're going to have to talk to people. And so. Oh, Jesus, God almighty. That's pipeline. Now, under these, the next two actually fall under pipeline and that's posture and position. These dictate your percentage of close. This is, this is. This, this will help you with what percentage of the people you talk to are you actually getting to, you know, to move forward, right? And so what's posture? You've probably heard that term. Most, most people have. Um, I'd heard the term too, but no one had ever given me like a, a definition of it. Like no one ever hit me with something that was like, oh, that makes sense. And so for me, the, the definition that, that, that I created is uh, posture is the belief in what you have 
regardless of external acceptance or approval. The belief in what you have, regardless of external acceptance or approval. Now, every person on here has posture around something. Most don't have posture around network marketing. So if someone's naysaying you, if a family member's picking on you, you're like, and you get defensive and you're angry and you don't really know what to say, um, but you're postured around other things. So if, you know, I have two little kids, right? So my daughter's almost seven. Uh, she's my, she's my firecracker and, uh, and I have a three-year-old boy. And so let's say that, you know, if you have kids on here, let's say you're at the, the park and you're at, you know, you take the kids to the park, you're having a good time. And someone says, Hey, is it, Hey, is that your, is that your kid over there? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my kid. And they say, man, they're ugly. Are you going to convince them? Are you going to try to turn them around? Are you going to try to say, no, 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 they're really cute. And they're just, they're just having a bad hair day. Um, I feel like that's not the point. I feel like the point is that what they said was rude because your kid might be ugly, but that doesn't mean that it's not rude for someone to come over and say that because that's, that's just rude because that's not nice. It's it's weird that you're trying to convince them that your kid is cute rather than convince them that saying that to someone is rude. Okay, some kids are ugly. No, 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 they're actually super sweet. And you know, if I get it, he's got this little bow tie at home and he's so, so cute. No, you're gonna say, get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. Why? Because you're postured around that. You don't care about their opinion, right? Posture is the belief in what you have, regardless of external acceptance or approval. So you don't. I just think that's a really weird position on that. I don't know. I. I just I feel like whether your kid is cute or ugly in that scenario is irrelevant. The point is what you said was incredibly rude. Don't say that to people. And. Here we go again with cutting off the friends and family or whatever because they don't support your business. And it's 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 so sad that how they're able to convince people to think of their friend or family member trying to relay some concerns to them because they care about them. If they didn't care about you, they would they wouldn't give a shit that you're doing network marketing but they do care about you and they care about your financial well-being that's why they don't want you to do it because they don't want to see you get burned by it so sometimes external opinions are useful are helpful are being put forward to you in order to protect you from harm it's not just that everyone is being super negative or everyone tried MLM and failed. I don't care if they accept, approve, or agree with the, the look of your kid. Get the heck out of here. You're not studying, how do I overcome that objection, Ray? What, what exactly do I say to turn them around so they do see my kid as cute? You will never ask that because you have posture. But people ask that about network marketing all the time. And so if someone said to me, uh, oh, those things never work, I say, hey, it's not fit for everyone. Do you know anyone that does want to make some extra money? And I literally, my heart doesn't alter its speed. Like if you had a heart monitor on me, you would see zero reaction because I just don't care what they think about the industry. I'm not trying to convince them. I'm not trying to turn them around. I'm not trying to, you know, do a dog and pony show or do the, well, in a corporate, you have, you know, the, the CEO and you have the janitor, right? I'm not doing any of that nonsense. I'm not dancing for them. I mean, and, and just showing up that way, people are kind of bewildered by it, right? And so it, it, it's fun. Like having posture when speaking to prospects equals fun. And so that does not sound like any definition of fun that I've ever heard. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so I had this lady in my team, Ashley, she was out of Alabama. And, uh, you know, I didn't do... I'm not a fan of requiring three-way calls for, you know, every talk or anything like that, but sometimes, you know, Hey, I'd get on there and, and fine. And so we get on with this guy 
And, uh, you know, and she does a good job. She edifies me. So she did that part right. And, uh, and this guy says, I've tried a bunch of these things and they never work. That's his opening line to me. And so what would, what would most people do? They'd say, well, this one's different. We're brand new, right? They do a little song and dance. I get a little cane and a hat, right? And they would do this. I would, I would like to see this dance this goofy dance that would not work because it would keep the prospect in power and you out of power. Okay. So what would the postured person do? Right. So here's, here's what I did. He said, I've tried a bunch of these things and none of them ever worked. And I said, well, what makes this any different? You tell me what makes this time any different. And he wasn't ready for that. He's like, I would say exactly. Well, I'm really coachable. He did not. That this interaction never happened. That would never happen in real life. <laughs> See, posture in prospecting equals fun. It's it's fun. It's not a drag. Yeah, it's so fun being yelled at about how things never work. It's not it's not a stress ball. And so he said, uh, oh, you know, I'm coachable and you know, I really need to make some money. I'm like, oh, okay, great. And so we can continue. And so we continue. And then he tried it. He tried it later on. Later on, the same call. He tried it again. He tried to take the power. And he said, uh, well, tell me about the comp plan. And I said, did you know the comp plan of those other companies? And he said, yes, I did. And I said, well, I guess it didn't matter. <laughs> it's fun. Should be stressful. Stop stressing. That sounds incredibly stressful to me. Understand this. There's more of them than there are of you. And what I mean by that is there are more people with problems than a solution. See, you have a solution, right? Yeah, okay. People can solve a lot of things from what you represent. They can solve money problems. They can solve health problems. I don't know what, you know, what other things, you know, you guys got cooking, but they can. You guys cannot solve any health problems. Let's get one thing crystal clear here. Solve a lot of problems by what you know. And, and, and they have problems they don't know how to solve. This guy doesn't know how to make extra money. No clue. But I could show him. You don't know how to make extra money either. You only know how to do it if you get in in pre-launch, dude. So you only know how to do it on easy mode. Somehow, I have a solution. He does not. So why do we get so tangled up when they're skeptical? It's like, whatever, man, whatever. Um, another example. Oh, so posture, right? Just, just, just you knowing what you have, regardless of external acceptance or approval. You don't, I, I'm not dancing for them. When they pull this, these little power grabs, I'm just like, oh, whatever, right? And, and so uh, let's go to position. So position, again, falls underneath a uh, pipeline. And um, position, it will, if you're really frustrated with your prospecting and talking to people, it's probably because you don't understand position. So position is the knowledge of where is the prospect? Where are they? Where are they in the process? And so most people, frustration comes when speaking to other humans. Uh, it comes when you're trying, you're, you're, they're disjointed in your offer to where they are, right? So if you go, if you go to uh, your friends and say, hey, uh, you should totally join my team. It's awesome. You make money and stuff. And, and they're like, what the hell are you talking about, right? They're out of position. So position zero is, I don't know anything about their level of desire for what I'm doing. I don't know if they want to make extra money. I don't know if they're open to it. I don't know anything, right? And so that's position zero. And you need to assume that everyone's at position zero. You don't know if they're open to taking a look at the product or the opportunity. And so step one is find out if they're open. Hey, are you open to take a look at what I'm doing to make some extra money on social media? No. They might say no. Okay, great. No problem. Cool. You don't then try to convince them to just give them, give me your credit card because that's out of position. That doesn't make any sense. 
See, and that's how I know that that 30% is impossible because that's how most of your interactions are gonna go. Right? And, and so it should be basic, but, but it's not. I mean, it is basic. It's just not basic in the way that you think that it's basic. And, and you'll have a network marketer come in and they go to their friends and say, hey, hey, you should join my team, buy my product. I helped you move in college. And they're like, what the hell is that? What, is this a friend tax? I'm like, what are you talking about, man? And then that network marketer will go online and say, my friends are toxic. Yeah, they go online and say their friends are toxic because you told them to think that way about their friends. All right. You're asking for money. You're asking for commitment. You're asking for time before you even know if they're interested at all. You're toxic. They're not toxic. Would you ever buy a lumber yard and then hard pressure your friends to buy a two by four? Hey, I wouldn't buy a lumber yard. Hey, hey get down here. Get some plywood. Well, I don't think I need any. Come on, man. Come on. I bought Girl Scout cookies from your daughter. Get down here. No, that would be so strange. But people do it. And yet that's what you do. That's like your entire industry. In network marketing literally all the time. And then they say. Yeah, that's that's it. There's no other way. Their friends are toxic. How dare they? Right. Silly. Silliness. OK, so you're self-aware then. Position. So here's the number one thing to know about position. It will change your results. It will absolutely change your results. It's a game changer. Uh, change it frequently. And that is in the absence of progress, fall back on position. Okay. And I'll, dem I'll demonstrate. I'll give you an example. Cause that's a little, sounds a little weird, right? In the app. Sure does. Absence of progress. When I can't move forward, I fall back on position. Okay. So I'm going to give you two. Uh, one. <laughs> you just repeated yourself. One scenario, one example. I recruited hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that hated the video. So I have a company video. I like my company video. I send them company video. They say they hate it. Sad face. Hmm. Most people would be like. That wasn't a sad face. Great. Upline. Michael, Amanda, come on, man. The video needs to be better. Come on, guys. Step it up, man. That's what most people would do. They would complain about the video because they think the video is the problem. In the absence of progress, fall back on position. Okay, so I mainly just had to get someone to watch the video, because if you're willing to watch a video, you're looking for something. And that's what I'm going to speak to. Well, yeah. And so I would say, hey, you open, take a look at what it is that I'm doing, make some extra money. Sure. Great. I got a video does a better job than I could do of explaining it. Want me to send that over? Great. All right. Here. If people hate the video and it's not good, then that means that you must suck a lot at explaining it if the video is still better than you. Here it is. Hey, what'd you like about it? Oh, I hated it. It sucked. It was the worst thing ever. I hate your guts for even sending it to me. Okay, it seems like you talk to a lot of really rude people. Oh my goodness. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> uh, hmm. Uh, well, uh, I guess the question is, what were you hoping to see? What were you hoping to see? That, that question has made me tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. What were you hoping to see? And I've never had them say something crazy. Well, I was hoping it'd grow my arm back, right? I was hoping I could pour it out back and Bitcoin would spew like a fountain to the heavens. I've never had them say something crazy. They've always said something we can help with. They said, well, I was hoping I could do it as a single person. It looks like. Well, well, clearly that's, I guess, because you're in network marketing. If you ever worked retail, you would only get crazy answers. Like everyone's married or I was hoping I could do it at night or I was hoping I could, you know, they part time because they just draw a different conclusion from what was presented in the video. And then why are you showing this video? 
And so I never really, I wasn't so uptight about how good is the video. The only thing that just my personal preference. Then why, like, why are you showing this video if it's so bad? I don't like, there's a, I don't know. If, I should probably know if you guys do this or not, but um, I'm not a big fan of, of sending like, like I send a, I send a 32 second teaser video. Like I'm not a fan of that. I'd rather send a video that has some, at least enough where they can make a decision. I know there's, there's like a trend now where, you know, it's like videos are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And now we're just sending, it's like, hello. And, and Hey, did you watch that? You know, it's to me, it doesn't make sense. I want to send them something that at least gives them a little bit of me. Imagine thinking that videos are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Like, I mean, maybe on TikTok, but. So they can make a possible decision. But if they watch it, I'm going to fall back on what we hope to see. And a lot of times that conversation that happens right there, uh, you know, that's how I get them on board is just saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else lost? I'm lost. Yeah, we got plenty of people doing that. We got plenty of people do it part time. Most of my people do it part time. Yeah, come on. I'll show you how. It's impossible to do an MLM part time. It's it is not possible. It's not. Um, here's another example of position. This will this will be helpful too. So, I had uh, this lady uh, Amy. Uh, she used to be an executive for HBO. She was out in I, I assume Los Angeles, I guess, and um, and she gets me on uh, with a, a talent. Uh, this lady that owned a talent agency that served actors and, and actresses. And, and so uh, she made a very fatal mistake. Uh, she didn't edify me. She edified the prospect, always a bad idea. And so she was like, Ray, this is whatever, Barbara, uh, this is Barbara. She owns the biggest talent agency in Hollywood and everyone knows her and she's amazing. And it was incredible. She's, you know, everyone's just, she's got a huge business and blah, 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 blah. and Barbara, here's Ray. That was, I think you don't know what the word edify means. My introduction. Here's Ray. And so I'm just a little guy with little arms, right? I'm like, hey, baby. Right. And so Barbara, of course, you know, she takes on the persona of the big dog, right? So she goes, hello. She even had this like, like resonance in her, in her voice. Hello, little. Well, yeah. I mean, if you work with actors and actresses, it was kind of part of it. Ray, right? she didn't say little, but she might as well have. I'm like, hey, I'm down here. Hello, down there, little home business guy. All right. And so that's just how she showed up. She's like, hello, Ray. But she did say, she said, I told Amy I'd look at her little home business. How are you doing? I swear to God, that was her line. Hello, Ray. I told Amy I would look at her little home business. How are you today? That's, that's, that's what she said to me. So I'm, I'm like this, right? And so this is like, a, you know, from Star Wars, right? She had the high ground, right? I can't recruit her if she's got the high ground, right? She got the high ground. You, you just can't, re you can't recruit like that, right? You can't, you know, um, they're way too important, right? You're going to be fighting an uphill battle. So I have to even it. I got to, I get even it. And, the, and I'm just, I'm so confused. I get annoyed easily. So I, I, you know, I want to even it as fast as possible. Okay. And, and so uh, I use position, right? Well, pro I guess the combination of posture and position. Okay. So in the absence of progress, I fall back on position. What position am I in? She's on the call. And so I used that. I use posture and position. And so I said, uh, uh, you know, I'm down here. I said, well, I, I guess I'm a little confused. If your business is so good, why are we on this call? What? And so, and she says, uh, she goes, well, <clears throat> clear to the throat. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, the business has changed a lot over the years and, uh, you know, I've lost a few clients and, um, you know, it's gotten a little tougher out here. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Oh, well, let me just be really smug then. Okay. Now we can have a conversation. I can't, I can't have a conversation like this. It's just a waste of freaking time. 
And so like now, now we can have a conversation. So we, so we had a conversation. She joined uh, the, this entire call is a waste of time. The Alabama guy joined too. And, and so this is understand position is, is one of your most valuable assets. It will have you stop getting tripped up by, by things that don't need to be, you don't need to be tripped up. Um, you know, for example, if you're trying to close someone who has told you they're not open, you're toxic and you're frustrated, stop doing that. So there were people that I prospected, Hey man, you know, I'm doing this thing. It's pretty cool. You open and take a look at it. No. Okay. Great. All right. Go, go colds. Right. You know, like good luck. And, and we would remain friends. I had some of my closest friends tell me now it's fine. And so pipeline posture position leads us to perspective. Now perspective there, are the two primaries are pipeline and perspective. Okay. Now, I have learned, I have learned, now I, I know that majority of us, possibly all of us, um, can't have perspective without pipeline, okay? You can't just be the super positive thinker, never talk to a soul and have a thriving business. Now, are, have certain yogis achieved that? Have certain monks achieved that? Oh, maybe, I, I, I think probably that some people can manifest out of thin air and never, you know, it's crazy. I'm not there what the fruit are we talking about yet working on it working on it and so uh you can't just have perspective no pipeline build a business but i've also learned the tougher reality that is you can't have great pipeline with a bad perspective and build a large business I used to think that you could outwork your perspective, that you could outwork your mindset. What are, what the fuck are we talking about? I don't, I am so lost. I'm gonna have to cut so much of this out. That if you had a terrible mindset, if you just talk to more people, make it happen, man. And the truth is I've been proved wrong too many times. I've, I've met people that have literally prospected 30, 40, 50 people a day for years. And you're like, and how big's your team? You have four? Four, four on on the team. Um, wow. Okay. And and so I've learned that you can't you can't have a even with a humongous pipeline. You're talking to people every single day. You're following up every single day. You're sending videos every single day. Um, if there's something with your perspective, then uh, you, you're going to really limit your potential. You're really going to limit what results you get. Right. So that way when you are talking to the number of people that they told you to talk to and you're talking to you know 20 people a day or whatever they said it was and you're not getting that um that five to ten percent that they were saying you would would be able to get or even more outlandishly that three out of ten that they were saying you'd be able to get when that's not happening for you, even though you're talking to the number of people that they that they that they told you to, then they can fall back on. Well, it must be your mindset. It must be your perspective. You're not doing the perspective right. That's why you're. That's why nobody's joining, even though you're talking to the number of people that you told that I told you to, and even though you are doing all the other things that I told you to do. Well, that, that's why it must be your mindset. Your mindset's not good. So, you, you know, it's not the MLM that doesn't work. It's you that don't work. And so what's perspective? Perspective is where you spend the majority of your time in your mind. And um, this is, so this is not, some people will say, uh, well, I do affirmations. Okay. You do affirmations for four minutes in the morning, then you complain about your coffee, then you complain about the bacon, then you complain about the traffic, then you complain about your spouse, then you complain about complain about complain about these darn shoes, and you complain about, you know, how she has a prettier purse than yours, and then you complain about how come her business is larger than you complain about, right? And so actually, 99% uh, of your day is spent complaining. Uh, that's your perspective. Not that you did your, uh, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm a millionaire, which you don't believe anyway, which you don't believe anyway. And, and so um, there are very specific things to perspective that can uh, grossly alter the speed at which you acquire, the speed at which you manifest. And so there are 
uh, subcategory, uh, really four keys to. I feel like his perception of complaining is kind of rooted in misogyny. Just based on the examples that he gave. I feel like he just hears women complaining and that's all he hears or something. I don't know. It's just the it's just weird those examples that he gave. Having a magical perspective. Four keys. Number one, decide what you want. Decide. And for some, that's difficult. Like I some people I'll say, hey, what is it that you want? And they'll tell, they'll say, well, I don't want to be stressed out and I don't want to be in this dumb house and I don't want to be right. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want? Have you even thought about it? And, and this is a, uh, yeah, see, you know, here I am working a job and, you know, employing people where it's like, what do you want? And they want, they, they want the pay. Uh, this is a sad reality for for some people. You know, we do some work with uh, the foster care system. And, you know, my uh, very good friend, I help her run uh, uh, fundraisers and she's just amazing. I, I basically have her free coaching, uh, but she's the the top lead psychologist and, and runs the top company that serves the foster care systems in like uh, three counties, maybe four now in Florida. And so she sees some stuff. She sees some stuff. And um, last Christmas, we bought uh, eight, we had made 800 toys for kids under 10 that just weren't going to get anything for Christmas. And so uh, we, we delivered, uh, we delivered some of them, not all of them, but uh, we took our kids uh, uh, on a delivery to a foster home. There's like 11 kids in this, you know, fairly, you know, not great a small house and, um, and just to see their gratitude. It was just, it was just amazing. I wanted my kids to see that. And, and just to see. I hate that attitude. I don't like that attitude of using the children who are in the foster care system and, and using them like some kind of zoo or something for you to take your children to so that your children will be more appreciative of you. That's garbage. That's a load of garbage. I understand where it's coming from. That's a load of garbage. These are human beings. They are not your little tour to, you know, use as a disciplinary tool or something for your own kids. Okay. That's disgusting. Shame on you. You know, this, this, you know, three-year-old girl just hugging this thing. She's just holding it. It was so precious to her. Ah, I'm going to get choked up if I talk about that anymore. So we're going to stop. And, and so um decide what you want but when i when we went to this one foster home and it was mainly uh teenagers and uh you know uh, i think it was ranging from eight to maybe uh actually maybe 12 or 13 i don't know no there were some older kids eight to eight to maybe 15 and and we asked them we said hey um you know and they had been there a while um you know some of their parents could have gotten them back uh, because they were placed there from domestic abuse or whatever. And um, they just didn't take them back. Pretty sad. Some good kids. Parents literally could get them back, not taking them back. And, uh, and so we asked them, what is it that you want? And they looked at us like we were nuts. They're like, what, what do you mean? Like, you know. Okay, that's not a foster child thing. I'm pretty sure most teenagers, if you were like, if you just were like, what do you want in this grandiose manner? They would probably be like, what are you talking about? Like, go away. Well, what would you like? You know, what, what, would you, what do you want? Like, what, what would make your time here better? And, and they're just, they're kind of looking at each other. And it was really... Um, like you, you, you can't cry in front of them. Right. But you wanted to cry. Like my heart was literally. I'm sorry, but that sounds like a totally normal teenager response. <laughs> they don't know what they want. They just know every, everything is weird. And plus these are foster kids and some random persons coming in here and being like, what do you want? Who are, well, who are you? Really breaking. And, um, and one of them piped up eventually and said, I guess some more board games. 
And I just, I like, I so wanted, I so wanted to like just burst out crying, man. Cause you know, I wasn't in foster care, but I, I grew up in a very, very abusive home. And so I, you know, I, I get that where you're in survival, you really want love. You want connection. You want your parents. Um, you're not thinking about toys. Like my daughter spends every waking moment thinking. And, and so identify, what do you want? Number two, which this will I think they, and at that point though, I think they just wanted more board games. Bring pipeline in. You do have to do the work because you have to logically believe that you're on the path to get that. That's why most, most people, they, they very misunderstand law of attraction. They really don't understand that at all. And, um, if you're right, exactly. When it, when it doesn't work, it's because you're misunderstanding it. If you're, you know, for the majority of people, if you're not doing the work, there's going to be a piece of you that just will never believe that you'll get what you want. Ah, uh, see, it's because you're not doing the work. And so you do have to do the work. Okay. So decide what you want, do the work pipeline, right? Number three, this is the gotcha. This is the one that stops 99% of people. You have to stop noticing your missteps. You have to stop dwelling upon sharing, getting around your girlfriends and talking all about that shit that you don't like, all the stuff you don't like. Okay. That's the hardest. That's the hardest because we're, we're so, and we're, we use our senses to define our reality so much so that it stays our reality. Right. And, you know, one of my uh, mentors, as opposed to what? Also, I'm so... Okay, so how is Pipeline in the four steps that he's giving us for perspective? If I thought that, I thought that perspective or Pipeline and perspective were like the two main topics and they, and they weren't subtopics of each other because I thought it was Pipeline and then the Pipeline involves posture and position and then now we're on perspective right and he's giving us four steps for that how is pipeline in here and friends dr joe dispenza he says your personality creates your personal reality and you know and i'm, I'm very blessed he's speaking at our event next month he's he's incredible and so he says your personality creates your personal reality and your personality is made of how you think how you act and how you feel most people try to change what's outside of them without changing what's inside of them. And that. Ah, see, you know, it's perfectly normal for your job to want you to change on the inside and to change your personality fundamentally. If look, listen, if you're just trying to change things in the world, but you're not willing to change your personality fundamentally, then you can just get the fuck out of here. Will never work. It literally chemically will never work chemically explain that because as you think that creates and, and limits or expands your choices okay this is from neuroscience okay so as you think how is it neuroscience to think that your that the world changes based on how you think I think these neurological networks are firing and wiring and and, and as and if, as you believe them them, as you verify them, as you find more proof to that they are true, that goes from the neocortex to the limbic brain, the chemical brain creates the neurotransmitter that creates the neuropeptides that communicate to the adrenal glands that create the emotion, the emotion of anger, the emotion of injustice, the emotion of, of envy, the whatever, right? That was complete gibberish. And so that chemical is created hits the adrenal glands, creates the emotion, communicates back to the neocortex and says, the adrenal glands, your adrenal glands are on your kidneys and they're just involved in like sympathetic response. This is how we're feeling. This is how we're feeling. And so that creates more corresponding thoughts of, oh, we're feeling that way. Oh, let me think corresponding thoughts. Yeah, because you're, you know, as we all know, your emotions are created in your adrenal glands. <laughs> And so now you're thinking and feeling, feeling and thinking, it's a loop, okay?
And so uh, we you know, we walk around and 90% of our thoughts are the same every single day. And so we're just noticing all the same stuff. Citation needed? Over and over and over. Yeah, he still didn't take out the trash. Yep, she didn't sign up either. Yep, they're going to reject me. And so that's, we're just constantly noticing. And so- uh -huh, And it's all your fault. So the key is for you to stop noticing the things in your life you don't like. Now I purposely- yeah, if there's something you don't like, it's your fault for noticing it. You should stop noticing it. They call it missteps for a reason, and I'll, I'll share that with you here in a second. Number four is what most people never do, but this, this one's actually easy. to. It's easier to do than number three. Number three is the killer. Number three is where most people say, yeah, Ray, but yeah, but you don't understand. Yeah, you are, you're, not a, you're not married to this guy right? Or, um, yeah, but you're not in my situation. Well, I mean, I was a million dollars in debt and in foreclosure and sleeping on my buddy's couch. So how did you get into a million dollars of debt? How did, how did you end up with that level of credit? I mean, I I've been in some bad situations, not all of them, not all of them. Right. And just a recap of the four components of perspective, decide what you want, do the work, Stop noticing your missteps. That's the tough one. Okay. Number this is so brainwashy. Number four, mental rehearsal. If there's a goal in your life and you're not mentally rehearsing you being in that, then you're greatly missing out on the speed quotient. You're greatly missing out. I mean, it's true that mentally rehearsing something and going through it like step by step before you do it can be really, really helpful. But that's still not going to get you into a place where you're getting a bunch of recruits and making a lot of money in network marketing. Like, it's just not. It's not because you're not mentally rehearsing it. It's because it's not possible. So you can there's so much proof of this. Um, you know, you, you listen to a, a, an Olympic athlete, majority of them, you'll catch in an interview how they saw that as a kid. They've been practicing that as a kid in their mind. They've been mentally rehearsing, winning that gold, standing on that stadium, getting, you know, getting the applause, getting the love, getting on the magazine. Standing on a stadium? What? Magazines, right? They've been mentally rehearsing this for a long time. That's not the mental rehearsal that they're talking about. You don't picture being like getting applause. You picture you're supposed to go through like step by step the movements that you're going to be doing. And so most what do they mentally rehearse? <laughs> worse, right? Worse situations, right? They, they mentally rehearse the bad stuff, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a fun study that um, um, I learned from Dr. Joe. They did this study uh, with, uh, it's, they call it the piano study. And so they took, um, I'm just going to shorten it here, but uh, mainly two groups. And one group, they provided with a piano, had them practice uh, 15 minutes a day. The other group, uh, they told to men, and they taught them some basics, right? Both groups, they taught some basics. One group, they provide piano, said, hey, practice every day for 15 minutes. Other group, uh, hey, I want you to um, uh, practice in your head. Like, do not, touch a, uh, do not touch a piano, practice in your head. So when they did brain scans, both brain scans in the specific regions that have to do with kinesthetic of touching piano keys and whatever else, were identical and they the the group that did play the piano every day improved by 23 percent the group that never touched a piano did it in their mind improved by 21 percent and so when i heard that um i yeah because we all know that the best people who play piano are people who've never played the piano okay i was like man where can I apply that? Like, what, what can I do? Right. And, and so um, I want you to think, and we'll, we'll, hopefully I'm okay. Am I okay? Go a little minute, a few minutes over. Okay. Um, and so I want you to think of, of, of two scenarios in your life. Um, scenario number one is what's something you wanted to change in your life and you were successful at. Okay. So you decided you want to lose weight or you wanted a better relationship or you wanted to, you know, recruit, you want to get, make some money or whatever, whatever, whatever 
you know, personal life, work life, whatever. So something in your life you wanted to change and you changed it. And then I want you to think of something that you wanted to change. Didn't change, didn't change. Okay. So you were unsuccessful at changing. You wanted to change it. Didn't change. And so I'll share, I'll share. God, like how inappropriate is this for work? Share some examples with you. I'll share my two, my two examples that, that I use. So I'll share the one where I didn't change. Okay. I had this big idea. I was going to learn hip hop dance. And, and I saw it, man. Like I, you know, you know, Jess and I were going to, you know, we'd be at a wedding and just randomly, I would just bust it out and just pat, 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 and people would form a circle around me and be like, what, what, right? It was going to be crazy. You know, we'd be at a club and all of a sudden I'd bust it out, right? And so what do I do, right? What do I do? I buy a course, right? I buy a 14-day course. It was 27 bucks. And, uh, you know, I look, I'm in my office here. I look around the corner, make sure she's not around. All right, shut the door, lock the door, put it on. Okay. And so I watched day one. I'm like, day one. Yeah, man. Oh, this is going to be awesome, man. Day two. Ooh, uh, that was a little tough, a little tough. I'm not sure. Like, how did he do that? I don't, I don't know. Um, but I got, I got through it. Day three. I'm like, oh man, um, I don't know how to do this. Like I, I, I don't, I watch it over and over and over day four. Well, maybe it's your mindset. Or I rewatch day three. Day five, I rewatch day three. I, I'm not getting it. Day six, I take the day off. Day seven, day off. Day eight, day nine, I come back, watch day three. Day, the rest, I, 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 you know what? Not that important. No big deal. I don't need to learn hip hop dance. That was stupid. Okay. And so how many show up that way? Right. I, sh I showed up that way. And so I showed up that way and that's, that's how it went. Right. That thus the end of my hip hop career, right. Never to blossom, never to flourish. Ne yeah. Yeah. That was the end of it. Never to get that circle around me with the hip hop. Right. Whatever. So what's an example of something that did change? Well, imagine thinking that that was like an interesting story. Last what's that? Oh, uh, so Last year was our 10 year anniversary. And, and so I decided that, you know what, I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna do something special. And so uh, just so happens to also be about dance, uh, but I decide I'm gonna buy ballroom dance lessons for her and I, right, the two of us. And so, you know, we're, you know, we got little kids, we're both busy, you know, you know, date night every once in a while, right? And so I'm gonna get ballroom dance lessons, you know, it'd be nice. And so, <laughs> I don't know where it's going to go, but you know, we do it. And, uh, God, straight people think that the most, they think that everything that happens to them in their relationship is a story. This is not a story. This is not interesting. This is barely an experience. You could have told this in one sentence. And so I start, you know, I start going to these lessons and, and I'm terrible. I mean, I'm bad, man. Like they're like, Ray, um, do you hear the rhythm? It goes doom dot to doom. It's a down, it's like a downbeat. That's when you I'm like, right. I'm like Frankenstein out there just stomping around, just haphazardly to no beat. And it just it just makes no sense. And uh they even asked me, I swear they asked me this, and they said, uh, Ray, um, um, were you in an accident or something? Like, are are your hips immobile? Um, do, do they, do they move? Like, can you do this? Um, and I'm like, yeah, I like, you know, it's, I'm terrible. I'm literally terrible. And, and I'm not, I'm not making that up. I, four months in. Okay. I'll just... Well, you, you can't just assume that someone can work a certain kind of way that someone can move a certain kind of way. You know, think about the examples here. Four months in, I'm going to two classes a week, two classes a week. Right. And these are uh, like not hour, but like 45 minute classes. I'm going to two 45 minute classes a week, four months in. There's a guy that a new student that came in early and he was lacing up his shoes and he's watching. And he rushes over when we finish to me and my wife and says, oh, my God, I'm so glad I came. I feel so much better. I'm like, thanks. Thank you. 
right? Because my wife is amazing, right? So she would dance with me like Frankenstein. And then she would dance with the instructor and be like, she'd fly into the air and, you know, it was just amazing, right? And people would be like, oh, you know, they, you know, she's incredible. And then she'd dance with me and her fire. And, and so, but maybe it's your mindset. That kick in the teeth, which it was, it hurt my feelings. And I'm like, man, I've been at this four months and two, three, three. and it plus a cost of fortune. Anyone ever do ballroom dancing? Cost of fortune, right? You got to buy these dresses. They're, you know, her dresses were three grand or whatever. Like you're spending all this kind of money. It's crazy. You spent what on a dress? And, and so that night I go home and I'm like, you know, I know all this stuff about mindset, but I'm not using any of it. I'm, oh my God, I'm a fucking wizard. I'm just showing up every day and I'm just like, I'm not really good at dance and, and I'm going to forget, right? And so I'm just like, I'm just this wimpy wuss, like just, this is just how I am. And so that night, everything changed. Every night I started seeing myself in my imagination being a good dancer. And so I asked myself two questions. What would it, how would it feel? How would it feel for me to be a good dancer? I'd feel confident. And I just saw myself gliding across the floor, just killing it, right? How would I know it's true? Well, if it were true, people would compliment me. So I started seeing people in my life, like see me dancing and start comp- Yeah, see, okay. Mindset, when we're talking about something like a physical, um, skill or a physical activity is going to be a lot more uh it's going to have a lot more of an effect on performance than it is for something like uh, like recruiting people for an mlm because it's not possible so yeah like of course that's true man if you're just thinking that you're bad at it then you're going to look unconfident and you kind of need to look confident when you're dancing complimenting me i saw my dance instructor say something i saw my dance studio owner say something and so i started seeing this and i go in and, and guess what i still sucked but i stopped noticing my missteps i stopped paying attention i stopped dwelling upon oh my god i've learned that a million times how come i'm still doing it and so Fast forward six months, uh, we come in first place in our division in two different dances at an international competition in Miami. And the instructors say to me, they're like, dude, um, you know, we got to be honest, like you weren't improving. <laughs> and it, it was just like, you just weren't improving. And then one day you just like, like a, I mean, you just like skyrocket. All of a sudden you got way better way faster it was amazing that must have been the day you started practicing at home kind of kind of um i didn't increase my pipeline i was still doing two classes a week i didn't go to three i didn't go to four i didn't practice at home but i spent about two minutes a day doing mental rehearsal in my head and i stopped noticing my missteps those were the two things i didn't change Oh, so you knew better than the instructors. Okay. Change for you. How many people am I prospecting? How many people am I reaching out to, following up with, setting appointments with? I didn't change any of that. I was still doing two classes a week. I didn't watch additional videos. I didn't I didn't practice at home. I spent a couple minutes a night, mental rehearsal, and I stopped noticing all the crap that was in that scenario that I didn't want. And that why don't you tell us what that competition that you got first place in was so that we can find out more information? Had me become a champion. And, and so um, what was the difference between the two? Okay. One, quit easy. Didn't have a coach. Didn't have anyone I could turn to. Hey, this video three, man, it's not making any sense. Right. One, show, the other showed up when he didn't feel like it. I mean, there were many days that I had a rough day at work or someone had quit or, you know, I had to fire somebody or something like that. And I'm showing up and I'm just like in my head. I'm just like, I don't want to be here. But I'm going to do it anyway. And so it's doing the work when you don't feel like it. It's it's showing up no matter what. It's learning from others. It's not noticing your missteps. It's mental rehearsal. It's, it's doing the work. And that is the difference. Right. And and, you know. This is 
you know, people have to understand this, man. The more time you spend noticing what you don't like, that is what you're going to get more of. That's going to expand. That's what's going to get all of your energy and attention. And so those are the four P's, right? Pipeline, posture, position, perspective. Um, perspective is your speed quotient. That's what will take your same pipeline, and make it produce a whole lot more. And so that's why I'm so adamant on, on teaching that and giving you examples, demonstrating and, and sharing maybe some fun stuff with you. Um, yeah, see, see what I mean? Straight people think that the that the that the most boring stories about their relationship are interesting and and uh, like they're not. We do have if you like this kind of stuff, uh we do have our 3-day event uh next month in Orlando in October, uh October 27th to 29th. Uh we do have some in-person tickets left. Um, I did put together a, a discount for those that may want to come. You can watch online. Uh, we have a, a silly deal to watch online. You can you know, watch it. I discounted it for this group. Uh, you can literally imagine paying for this shit. Watch online for $27, which is ridiculous. Um, or and there's other upgrades. There's upgrades available if you want. $27 for this garbage. You know, more bells and whistles. Um, or, uh, we have a few options to come in person as well. Uh, we have Dr. Joe Dispenza, one of my mentors and someone I'm so, so grateful for. Uh, we have Russell Brunson. Uh, we have, um, we now have three, eight figure a year earners coming. Um, and this is a generic event. There's no one can say their company. There are no company names talked about. Um, but we have a lot of rock stars, uh, coming and, uh, I'll just, I'll just drop the link and I'll, I'll roll it back to you, Mike. Yeah, and, th and that's what you'll notice. Um, and I did put the link, but the link is Higdon Group. It's my last name, higdongroup.com forward slash transform. All right, they're all transforming. <laughs> Just like Heidi, it's transform. You gotta transform. Oh boy. So that's where it ends because it's just concluding after this. That was terrible. Also, that didn't tell me anything about Elomir, so I'm going to have to clearly watch some Elomir content. But that was really uh, it was a really good example of the brainwashy shit that they do. Um, and also some of the, uh, the emotional manipulation content was really interesting to see there. And that's the way it always works in these MLMs. All right, everybody. I've been Mac. Peace out. Bye.